Well, good morning and welcome to Avalon Church. Thank you for being here with us today, those of you that are in the room. Thank you for joining us online as well. As I've said for the past couple of months, we are one church in many locations, and we're just so glad that you're able to join us today. We're in this series called Questions, and we all have questions. We have questions for God. We have questions for each other. Our children have questions for us. Some of you probably have questions now, like, what has he got in his hand? Is he a shepherd? Um, is he, like, really old? He has to have a walking stick now. Uh, or you may be asking, why did he get his hair cut so short? There are answers to those questions, but you'll have to see me afterwards to get them. But today, we're going to look at the question that God asks of us. And we've been looking at some of these questions that God asked. Last week, we, asked, we looked at the question that God asked, can dry bones live? And we talked about, is there life after death? And today, we're going to focus on a question that God asked Moses. Yes, that Moses, the one that led the nation of Israel out of Egypt. You all know who he is. And God asked Moses this question. He said, what is in your hand? What is in your hand? A very, very important question. And I believe it goes to the idea of purpose or serving. One of my favorite quotes, and I've shared it with you multiple times, um, is from Mark Twain. He said this, the two greatest days of a man's life are the day he is born and the day he figures out why. And that goes to the idea that there is a purpose to life, that there is a reason for our existence. Now think about this. There are some believe that we're just random accidents, that we're just random chance. There's no real creator, no real God in charge of things, and they believe that as a result of that, we have no purpose. We just are. We just exist. Whatever we choose, that is our purpose. And I would suggest to you that that is a life that is not worth living. It is a life devoid of all hope. Because once you begin to live life, and once you've gotten some experience in life, you know that there has to be a reason for being here. Well, we're going to look today in the book of Exodus and the story of Moses. You remember Moses. He, he was born during a time of Israelite slavery in Egypt. And they, his parents put him in a little boat, a little ark, because the Pharaoh had commanded that all the babies be killed. And so um, they did this and... Moses was discovered by Pharaoh's daughter. As a result, he was adopted into Pharaoh's family. And for the first 40 years of his life, he was a Hebrew, but he lived in the palace. He was being trained to be a Pharaoh. He had access to all of the greatest education, the best resources, the best leadership, the best opportunities in the world at that time. At around 40 years of age, uh, he had to run for his life because he saw his Hebrew people. They were, uh, one of them was being abused by an Egyptian. And Moses actually killed this Egyptian, buried him in the sand. Well, Pharaoh found out. Moses ran for his life. Now think of this. He was in the palace, and now he had to run for his life. And he became a shepherd. Now think of this. What an incredible story. Moses was a prince, and he had to be a shepherd. Incredible stuff. For 40 years, 40 years, he had lived his first 40 years in Egypt. He lived his next 40 years on the backside of the desert being a shepherd. He didn't even own his own sheep. He worked for his father-in-law. Now, in this story that we're going to pick up today, Moses is 80 years old, and he's walking along, tending the sheep, and he sees a bush that's burning. Now, that's maybe not so unusual, but when a bush that is burning but never burns up, that's unusual. And I love how the Bible, some of the wording of the Bible, I love it. It said, Moses turned aside. I would turn aside too. If I saw that, I'd be like, whoa, what is that? And so he goes up to check it out. And God began to speak to him 
from the burning bush. I realize that's an incredible story, but it's an incredible outcome for what God did for him. Well, God began to talk with Moses about he wanted him to deliver the children of Israel. And in Exodus chapter 3, we're not going to read that today, but in Exodus chapter 3, we learn this is where this story of the burning bush is happening, and God is telling him who he is. I am that I am. Uh, Yahweh, that's my name. It is a personal covenant-keeping God. And we learn from Exodus chapter 3 that God is holy, that God is to be worshipped, that God is righteous, that God cares for us. He sees where we are. And we could talk for a really long time about those things, but we want to look in chapter 4 today in this conversation between Moses and and God, and God is talking to Moses, and he asks him a very specific question that I believe you and I can learn from today. We can learn why we're here. We can learn about the purpose of life. We can learn our reason for existing. So let's look at the screen, uh, Exodus chapter 4. And it says, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, and they shall say, the Lord did not appear to you. Let's go to the next screen. And let me just say this. Moses was talking, arguing with God a little bit. He's like, they're not listening to me. This is an incredible story. Nobody's going to believe it. And God said to him, what is that in your hand? Now I want you to focus on that question. What is that in your hand? And what was in Moses' hand was a staff. More specifically, it was a shepherd's staff, just like this. I ordered this. This is supposedly a hand-carved, handmade, real shepherd's staff. If you want to see it afterwards, you can come see it, all right? Uh, if you have sheep, you can have it, all right? Because I don't have any sheep, and I don't have any reason to keep this thing. But God says to him, he asked him, what is in your hand? And then Moses replied, a staff. Now, let me just pause right here. Anybody's life changed yet by this story? Anybody's like, whoa, what does God say? I've never thought about it. No, it's just pretty routine, other than the fact that God is speaking to him from a bush. That's pretty amazing, right? He says, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff, and he said, throw it on the ground. So he, he threw it on the ground, and it became a snake. Don't worry, this is not going to become a snake, all right? It became a snake, and the Bible says, Moses ran from it. Can I get a witness right there? Anybody else would run if your staff turned into a snake? Anybody? Anybody? How many like, some of you like snakes? All right. Uh, let, me, let me, there's a word for people that like snakes. What is it? In the Greek, actually, or the Hebrew, uh, there's a word, it's called weirdo. All right, so, no, nah, there's not really a word for that. But God told Moses to reach out. The Lord said, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. I love this. So Moses put out his hand and caught it. You know the image I get? It wasn't like he walked up to this snake and just confidently reached down and grabbed it. No, no. He was like, oh, I'm going to get that thing eventually. And Moses reached out and he caught it by the tail. And it became a staff in his hand. Now this next phrase I also want you to, to focus on. We talked about that phrase, what is in your hand? And this next thing I want you to see, that they may believe. When God asked Moses, what is in your hand? And he demonstrated that if he would give that that was in his hand to God, he said, there's something incredible going to happen. There's something that's going to give you a reason for existing. There's something that's going to give you a reason to live. That they may believe. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Now there are two things I want you to see from this passage that help us understand why God asked the question, what is in your hand? God says, what's in your hand? And then he says, if you'll use or give it to me, if you'll use it for my service, my glory, there's going to be a result that those people believe, that they're pointed to the cross, that they're pointed to God, that they're pointed to Jesus in their own life. 
Now, from this passage, when God asks him, what is in your hand, I, I think there's three things that I want you to see, and we'll be done, okay? Not going to be super long today, but there's three things that I want you to see. And here's the first thing. God uses anyone at any time. He can use anybody at any time. Now, back to Moses. He had a, a, a staff in his hand. He used to be in the palace. You would think that God would, like, come to him and say, Moses, you're in the palace. You're rich. You got a lot of power. I'm going to use you now. But that's not when God chose to use Moses. Isn't that interesting? He had left the palace, and he had become a shepherd. And for 40 years, all he had was what was in his hand. He, he didn't even own his own sheep. He worked for his father-in-law. Now, if I was going to use somebody to deliver literally the world, if I was going to use somebody to make a difference, the biggest difference in the world, you know, I would probably choose the guy that's in the political position, the powerful position, the man with a lot of money, but that's not what God did. He will use anyone at any time. Moses was 80 years old. You know what that tells me? That when God says he wants to use you, it is never too late. It is never too late. I, I talk with people all the time. As a pastor, I do talk to a lot of people. And I, I hear people tell me their story, and they have regrets. And I often hear people think that it's too late. I wasted my youth. I made some poor decisions before. I, I've messed up in the past. And in their mind, you know what they're saying to themselves? It's too late. It's too late for me. I've blown it. I, I can't recover from that. But I want you to know that God is saying it's never too late. You know how old Moses was? I've already told you. You know how old Moses was when he began to do the most significant work of his life? He was 80 years old. That's when most people are not thinking about work. They're thinking about rest. They're thinking about retirement. They're like, man, I don't want to work. But God used him, and it's never too late for God to use you. What about the little boy that gave his lunch to Jesus? Here's the story from the New Testament. You remember the miracle that Jesus did when he took five loaves of bread and two fish, and he fed 5,000 people, men, not including women and children. It was probably more likely around 20,000 people that God used a little boy's lunch. Now, we don't even have the name of this little boy recorded for us in the Gospels, but he gave his lunch to Jesus. And this is what it tells me. You're not too insignificant. You're not too small. Some people think that their gift is insignificant. They think that because they don't have the gift of a Billy Graham, that it doesn't matter if they're faithful. It doesn't matter if they serve. It doesn't matter what they do. Oh, they're not going to miss it. And that simply isn't true. One of the reasons I believe that God says in... Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians that God uses the weak things to confound the strong. He uses things that people don't even consider worthwhile to use and to do his, his glory. And here's the point. God will use anyone at any time. You're not, it's not too late. You're not too small. You're not too insignificant. And your circumstances are not too bad. You ever notice that when it comes time to maybe stepping up to do something where God wants to use us, we always make an excuse. We tend to say, well, you know, I'm really, really busy right now. I don't have time. Well, that's a circumstance. Or, you know, as soon as I get out of college, I'm going to start making a difference. As soon as I retire, I'm going to have a whole lot more time on my hands. As soon as I get the kids a little bit more grown up so we don't have to run around so much, then I'm going to be faithful. There is no excuse of circumstance. You can always be used by God when you give to him what is in your hand. There's a story in the Old Testament in the book of Judges. The book of Judges records the judges of Israel. They had been delivered from the land of Egypt, and this was before their first king, King Saul, was anointed. The second king of Israel was David. Um, and so... Um, the book of Judges records the exploits of the people that became the leaders of Israel. Now, 
and, ju- and a judge. God was considered the, the leader of the nation. And this judge would be a, sometimes a, a, a military leader. They would step up and they would become the political leader, but also the spiritual leader. Um, but they weren't actually a king, even though they did have political power, sometimes military power. So in the book of Judges, there's a story about a man named Naaman. Naaman. He was the commander of the Syrian army. And if you don't know much about Bible history, that's okay. The Syrian army, they were the enemies of Israel. And Naaman actually led raids into the land of Israel where they would capture people's property, they would steal their stuff, and they would even take many of the people hostage and take them to be prisoners of war. In his case, there was a girl. She was a young girl. We don't know exactly how old she was, but she's called a young girl. And he captured her, obviously ripped her away from her family. And to add insult to injury, he made her a servant to his wife. Now get the picture. He was the enemy of the nation of Israel. He was a very powerful man. He took this little girl away from her home He caused her to serve in his own house. I can't think of much worse circumstances. Can you? Terrible. Well, the Bible says that Naaman developed leprosy. Leprosy in the Old Testament was an incurable disease. It's not like the things we think of now, but it was a disease that was a death sentence. There was no cure for it, and you were slowly going to die a very painful death. Naaman, the powerful general of this army, had leprosy. This little girl, in the story, she, out of love, tells Naaman that there is a prophet in Israel that can heal his disease. Now, when I think about what my reaction would have been, if I were in that circumstance and I found out that my captor had an incurable disease, I'd be like, yeah, you can rot, buddy, as far as I care. You deserve this. But not this little girl. She loved the God of Israel. She loved Jehovah himself. And in her love, in spite of her circumstances, she pointed Naaman to a way of salvation. Well, to make a long story short, he ended up going and visiting the prophet, and he was healed. Now, what does that tell me? It tells me that there are no circumstances wherein that we can find a good excuse not to serve God. Oh, I realize different people have different schedules. Not all of us can do the same thing. Not all of us have the same talent. But here's what I know. Your circumstances are not an excuse. God can use you in spite of your circumstances. And and I love this. Um, The thing about a staff, remember God asked Moses what was in your hand. Here's the thing about a staff. It fits you. It's unique to you, and only you can use it. Now, when it comes to serving God, he has given everybody something in their hand, some kind of talent, some kind of ability. Not everybody has a singing ability. Not everybody has a leading ability. Not everybody has a preaching ability. But we all have something that we can do. We all have something that is in our hand. And God will use anybody at any time that is willing to give what is in their hand to him. Isn't that good news? God will use you in a way greater than you ever thought possible. Here's the second thing I want you to see. God uses what is given to him. He uses anything that's given to him. Let's look at this verse uh, that we find in the book of uh, 2 Corinthians, I believe it is. Let's get that verse up. Um, It's uh, 2 Corinthians Uh, it says, I'm going to have to look at a different screen because my eyes are going bad. Here we go. If you are eager to give, God will accept your gift. Notice, on the basis of what you have to give, not on what you don't have. You know what God's saying here? He'll use what's given to him. Now, here's the thing. We've always thought, boy, if I had her talent, boy, I would do something. Or if I was like him, Boy, I tell you what, I would do something. Or if I had their money, I tell you what, I'd give. 
Well, during the offering today, you reach into their pocket, take their wallet out, and then, then you can give. I'm just teasing. You don't do that. You might get beat up if you do that. But here's the point. God does not judge you for what you don't have. God does not hold you accountable for abilities you don't have. He asks this very personal question, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? Anything that is given to God, he will use for his glory. He will use to further the kingdom of God. I've said before, the greatest ability is availability. And I really do believe that God will use whatever is given to him more than you ever thought possible. I've already told you the story about the little girl that pointed Naaman to, to God. About the little boy that gave his lunch to Jesus. And wherever you are, whoever you are, and whatever you have, if you'll give it to God, he'll use it more than you ever thought possible. I lived in Florida for 13 years. My wife is from there. She lived there for the first 31 years of her life. And uh, we met in college. I had moved from North Carolina to Florida. I went to college there. And uh, we met. And I became a youth pastor after graduating from college, from Bible college, and was a youth pastor in the state of Florida for 10 years. And while I was there, uh, there was a young man that was in our church, and his name was Danny. I've shared this story with some of our students before, but Danny was, he was a good person. He was a good kid. We all knew that uh, he was really going to be used of the Lord, but there was nothing particularly outstanding about him. He wasn't a great athlete. He wasn't like some singer. Uh, he was a good kid, but whatever he had, he gave completely to God. We had an outreach one time on Daytona Beach, Florida, and I'll never forget, this was during spring break, uh, the entire football team for Michigan State University was on the beach there at Daytona Beach. And Danny this young kid, he was probably 15 years old, very small compared to these giant football players. This young man walks up. There must have been 50 or so of those football players there, plus he included girls and friends. There were over 100 people in this group. He walks up to this group of people, and he begins to tell them about Jesus. He wasn't being like, you know, the weirdo. He just began to talk to them about how God loves them. And two of those football players, they mocked him. And he kept on talking. And these two football players grabbed him and marched him out into the middle of the water and threw him into the water. Everybody laughed. They thought it was so funny. And little 15-year-old Danny, he got out of the water, kind of brushed himself off, and he walked back up to this group of football players. And he begins to tell them about Jesus again. Once again, they mocked him, and these guys grabbed him, and they took him out. Everybody was laughing. They threw him in the water. Well, this went on about three or four times. After about the fourth time, he walks back up to this group, and they went to grab him again. And the leader of this group, and I don't know if he was the captain of the football team, but he was obviously a leader. He said, stop. Don't lay a hand on him. He's got more guts than all of you put together. And if he's got this much guts, you're going to listen to what he says. This little 15-year-old kid with over 100 people gathered around him, he began to share the love of God with them. And several of those big old tough football players gave their life to Jesus Christ. What am I saying? I'm saying if you'll, if you'll give whatever you have, it may not be a lot. But if you give it to God, he'll use it. Whatever you have, however you um, find yourself, whatever situation you find yourself in, if you give what is in your hand to God, God promises that he will use it. Um, I don't really have time to talk about uh, this, but in the book of Judges, there was a man named Shamgar. He became the leader of Israel. And you know what the Bible says about him? There's only two verses about him in the Bible. It says he killed 600 Philistines with an ox goat. You know what an ox goat is? It's a stick probably about this long. And it's got a sharp point on the end of it. And it was used to goad cattle, right, or sheep or whatever, like to keep them in line. Let me just tell you, if you are able to kill 600 bad-to-the-bone 
warriors that are armed with swords and shields and arrows and spears, and all you got is a stick, an ox goad, you bad to the bone. That's all I'm saying. I mean, you're talking about these superheroes being able to defeat people. Shamgar, all he had was a stick. And yet, because he gave it to God, God used him. What am I saying? I'm saying that God can use anyone at any time. He uses what is given to him. And then finally, he will use you for something that matters. Something that matters. Remember, I pointed your attention to that little phrase, that they may believe. That they may believe. You know that when you give your life, your talent, your ability to God, he will use you to make a difference. And, you know, we look at people in the world and the only people that we think make a difference are people like an inventor that invented some kind of program or computer or whatever, or some kind of national leader or some superstar of some kind. We're like, oh yeah, uh, she's got a million followers on Twitter uh, or on Instagram. She is an influencer. But you know what God says about you? You're an influencer. You may not have two followers on Twitter. Nobody cares, all right? The fact is you can be an influencer because God will use you to do something far greater than you ever thought possible. See, because in the kingdom of God, we don't look at things, uh, humanly speaking, the way God does. There was a woman in the church that I grew up in. To be honest, I don't really remember her name. I think her name was Martha, but I could be wrong about that. But I never forget how God used this woman. She never taught a Sunday school class. She never led a worship service. She never preached a sermon. To my knowledge, she never really even talked to very many people. She was very shy. But you know what she did faithfully, regularly, every single week of her life? She came to that church. She cleaned it. In fact, she swept and vacuumed and dusted and cleaned the bathrooms, made sure everything was in its right place, took out trash, and she never was paid for it. She never got any accolades for it. But every week she was faithful. You know what she did? She gave what was in her hand. She wasn't super talented that I know of. She gave what was in her hand. She was like, you know what I can do? I can clean the church. I can be responsible for that. And she did. And you know what I believe? The Bible tells us, Jesus himself said, that often it's the least of these that are going to be the greatest in heaven. The people that we think that are the least, the least important, the people that we think are the most important, those that brag, those that have all this bravado, he said they're going to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And it's not that he was saying that leadership is unnecessary or that talented people don't matter to him. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that people that don't think much of themselves, people that others don't think are that big of a deal, you are a really big deal to God. Martha, I really do believe this with all my heart. She's in heaven now. And I believe with all my heart that she will reap the reward of every person that got saved in that church, hundreds and hundreds of people. She is partly responsible because she cleaned that church with the ability that she had. She was partly responsible for the hundreds of people that are now in heaven because what she did was God said, what is in your hand? And she said, here's what I got. And she gave it to God. You know, God's not going to ask you what you don't have. He's not going to hold you accountable for the things that you don't have. He's not going to hold you accountable for money that you don't have or talent that you don't have or abilities that you don't have. But what he is going to do is ask you this question when we stand before God. What did you do with what I put in your hand? We all have different abilities, don't we? And there are ways for us to serve him. There are ways for us to make a difference. And my challenge for you is that you do that. You know, one of the things about a shepherd's staff, and I think when you read the Bible, you preach and teach the Word of God, you've got to be careful that you don't make things over symbolic. 
But I believe there is a great symbolism with that staff. You know, Jesus said, I am the great shepherd. Jesus said that we are like sheep. When we are part of his family, we're like sheep. Um, he said that uh, his sheep know him. They follow him. Here's the thing about a shepherd's staff. God put that in Moses' hand. A shepherd's staff, it's used to encourage, to guide. It keeps sheep in line. It's an offensive weapon used to protect the sheep. And one of the main things that a shepherd's staff does, you know what it does? It keeps the sheep close to the shepherd. Here's what I believe. When you give what is in your hand to God, He's going to use you. He's going to make sure that you, what you do matters to the kingdom of God. It may, you may never make headlines. You may never stand on a stage in front of a lot of, a lot of people. That's okay. Give what you have to Him. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help all of us to give what is in our hand to you. I pray for those that need to receive Jesus today, that today would be the day that they would receive you as their Savior. I pray that there would be people that watch this service, that listen to this service that they are challenged to give what is in their hand to you. Help them to do it. For some people, it's going to be money. For some people, it's going to be their talent. For some, it's going to be the things they enjoy doing. They need to think of ways, creative ways, that they can use that for you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us all to be aware that if we will give to you what we have, if we'll say to you, God, I don't really know what I'm good at. I don't know what I'm able to do, but I want you to use me. God, help them to say that and pray that to you today. Before we finish our prayer, I wonder if there's anybody that would like to pray to receive Jesus as Savior today. If you are joining us online or if you're here live in the audience and you would like to receive Christ Pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. I'm asking you to save me. I'm asking you to be my shepherd. I am giving what I have, my life, my heart to you. You'll pray that prayer online. I hope you'll check that you raised your hand. Click that you raised your hand. Click that you received Christ today. If you did that today in the service with no one looking but me while everyone's head is bowed, I wonder if you would raise your hand and say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer along with you today that I would be saved, that I would receive Christ as my Savior. Anybody like that here today? I want to encourage you that you would give what you have to Him. Maybe it's a talent. Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's something else. But God spoke to you today, and I would challenge you to take your next step with Him today. Heavenly Father, help us to give what is in our hand to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, I'm so glad that you joined us today. Joining us online or whether it's in person, we are one church in many locations. So let me talk about the next step. We've already talked today about the Next Step class coming up that's going to be through Zoom, and you can join us that way. Uh, or maybe your next step is uh, to get baptized. Sign up for baptism. We're going to do that soon. We're looking at some creative ways to do that. And uh, maybe your next step is to get involved in a ministry or to serve. Whatever your next step is, I hope you'll take that today. And I would challenge you today that if you pray to receive Christ, let us know online or let us know by filling out a next car, step card here in person today. Make sure that you, if you're new, fill out a next step card for us and drop it in the basket on the way out. Or if you're watching online and you're new, you've never filled out one of these cards, fill out the next step card. I really encourage you to do that right now. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. I want you to know that I love you. I'm so glad that those of you that are able to be here live, you came out today. And I'm so very thankful that all of you joined us online. I cannot wait to see your face. I cannot wait until we're able to meet face to face again. And that's going to be soon. Hang in there. I love you. God bless you.
Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.